morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all. We have launched our annual year-end giving campaign that will continue through December. As a small nonprofit, we depend on the support of our viewers to raise money for these live streams, which we offer for free. So please stay tuned for just a few minutes at the end of this program to find out how you can contribute. My staff and I greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, a conversation with Congress member Karen Bass, moderated by politics professor Dan Schnur. We will be taking questions for today's program in about 25 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Today's introduction will be made by the Honorable Lorna Johnson, who is a member of our board of directors. She is also a renowned businesswoman, philanthropist, healthcare professional, and community advocate, and honorary consul general of Jamaica. Lorna, we are so appreciative of your participation and support on today's program. I also just want to do a shout out to all of our board of directors who help us every day through their commitment to our mission. We're looking forward to a terrific discussion, Lorna. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, for the wonderful introduction. It's truly an honor to be here with the group. And um, I'm looking forward to a great discussion with my friend, um, Congresswoman Karen Bass, an amazing woman. Um, she's been in the Senate for a while and fighting for us. And it's really exciting to um, share this space with her once again. Um, I've interviewed her a few times on my show and it's been just awesome. So it's great to have her. Yes, Lorna, thank you so, so much. And Congresswoman Karen Bass, on behalf of the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall and our, all of our members, we're just thrilled to have you with us today. We know what a critical time this is in Washington and how busy you are. And the fact that you're willing to take some time to be with us for this conversation means a great deal to all of us. So thank you very, very much. I'm just sorry that uh, it can't be in person, but it's nice to be with Town Hall again. And it's also wonderful to see my dear friend, Lorna. Mm -hmm. Great well, to see you, great we'll, to see add, you. we'll add this to the list of things that we've been forced to do by Zoom in 2020 that we'll hope to do in person in 2021. That's um, right. But my, my first question, and I know you'd rather much rather talk about important matters of public policy, but Congresswoman, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that today there are rallies taking place both in Los Angeles and Sacramento under the auspices of very well-respected advocacy organization, the Courage Campaign. Um, and they are advocating very loudly and very strongly for an African-American woman to be appointed to the United States Senate seat that uh, Senator Kamala Harris is about to vacate when she becomes vice president. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but our members would get very, very upset if I didn't ask you about the, not just the speculation, but the extraordinarily broad base of support that has arisen on behalf of uh, your potential appointment to that seat and the number of calls and letters and emails that Governor Newsom is getting oh. ad for, advocating for you. So you indicated uh, over the weekend that that is a position you might be interested in. I wonder if you'd be willing to share more of your thoughts on this with our audience. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, once again, thank you so much for having me on. And, and let me just say that um, what is happening is people understand the significance of there not being an African-American woman in the U.S. Senate. And as of as soon as um, Vice President Harris leaves, there will be one African-American Democrat, one African-American Republican, and that is it in the entire U.S. Senate. So Cory Booker will be by himself. And so the outpouring of support to me is not so much about me, as it is that people understand what a loss it will be for there not to be an African-American woman in the uh, U.S. Senate, especially given our outsized performance in this election that is finally being acknowledged because it actually wasn't anything new. It's just in the last two elections, people have discovered what has been happening for many, many years, 
which is one of the most loyal groups uh, for the Democratic Party are African American women. So I am, um, you know, honored by it, but I do see it as way beyond me. And of course, if the governor asked me to serve, I would be willing to do that. And I also respect uh, whoever he appoints and also understand what a difficult position that he's in. In the middle of a pandemic, now he not only has one appointment, he has two appointments to make. And uh, I don't wish to be in his shoes. <laughs> Well, and you know, the, the two appointments, of course, as Congresswoman Bass refers to, is it, it appears that he'll be appointing a new attorney general uh, once our uh, attorney general, Javier Becerra, is, is appointed as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Let me ask you this, Congresswoman. You've served us honorably in the House of Representatives for, for many years now, and before that, in a, you know, a, a, just demonstrating phenomenal leadership as Speaker of the State Assembly. How would you see, if you were to gain this appointment and become a United States Senator, how would you see your role changing? What priorities would shift? How would you approach this job differently than the leadership positions you've held in the past? Well, I actually think, you know, the experience that I had being speaker for two years, and ironically, it was in the middle of another terrible, terrible crisis in the state. And so leading during a crisis is, is something I have unfortunately had the experience doing. But in those two years, I did have the opportunity to learn about California as a whole and not just my district. So learning about the agricultural areas, you know, we had wildfires and terrible drought during those years, learning about the ocean. Um, I mean, there, our state is so big. When um, I first came in as speaker, we were the fifth largest economy on the planet. Uh, by the time I left because of the recession, we were the eighth largest. But one of the things that you really get an appreciation of in Congress is how large our state is. So I speak to some of my colleagues in the House and their entire state population is smaller than Los Angeles County. And so the vastness, the diversity in our state, it's just wonderful. I feel so blessed to be a Californian. And I do believe that a lot of exper the experience that I had in the state legislature will be applicable. And then of course I've spent 10 years in Congress. And so knowing uh, how the House and the Senate function and function together is some experience that I've also had. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to shift now to public policy because I know that's where you'd prefer the conversation goes. And of all the tasks that you and your colleagues are taking on in Washington right now, it's possible that there's none more important than the passage of a COVID, of COVID relief legislation. We've all been reading for the past several days, the last several weeks, the last several months about the importance of passing a relief bill. I'm wondering what type of update you can give us in these closing days of session as to what we should be looking for about the prospects for a relief bill. Well, I just really, uh, at this point in time, am so um, discouraged, but usually what happens in a legislative process like this with a very partisan uh, atmosphere is right when you're ready to give up, that's when the deal comes together. And so what it looks like it's gonna happen now will be two packages, one that will pass now and one that will pass later. It just breaks my heart to think that we already have a terrible problem in California with homelessness. And if we don't pass a relief package, then this is gonna be a contributing factor because people are gonna to begin to be evicted from their housing. They won't have jobs, they won't have unemployment insurance, and so they won't have a way to move into uh, other housing and they might wind up on our streets. And so I'm just hopeful that we will at least pass the extension of unemployment, we will at least pass relief for small businesses so that people can stay employed, and some of the other uh, items that people need, such as the supplemental check, I'm also hoping will be a part of this new package. But apparently right now, what we won't do is provide resources for state and local governments, and I just don't understand how senators, and of course I am not talking about our senators, but how senators from red states refuse to provide support for their own states. 
And more recently, we've heard Speaker Pelosi and, of course, President-elect Biden talking about this bill as a down payment for more right. sweeping action come, come, come 2021. I suspect by the tone in your voice, you expect that to be addressed in the new year. Well, absolutely. I mean, we just need to get through these next few weeks. <laughs> we just need to get through them because I do believe when we have a new Congress that we will be able to address the virus in a comprehensive manner. So everything we're talking about is connected to the pandemic getting under control. And I believe we're going to have to have this administration leave in order for there to be a national strategy that will be implemented. President Biden uh, and Vice President Harris have already been clear about what the national strategy is. You know that one of the first things he did was establish the COVID task force. And so I think it's gonna take us until the inauguration for us to really be able to tackle these problems. And, and, and once that milestone has been reached, obviously COVID is the most urgent and the most sweeping challenge a new president and new administration and new Congress will face. What other policy priorities, whether in the House or the Senate, will you be focusing on to make sure that they don't get lost in the shuffle of the urgency of the pandemic uh, uh, crisis? Well, the other priorities uh, relate to the pandemic. So for example, we have learned um, something that many people knew already, but that you have communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID, health-wise, social, and economic. Those communities have underlying health, social, and economic issues. Once the pandemic is under control, I'm hoping that we will be able to address those underlying issues so that the next time there is a crisis, these communities won't be hit so hard. Let me give you one example, education. I am deeply concerned about our students because you know that in many schools, in many communities, there already is an achievement gap that existed before the pandemic. Well, those very schools, those very communities is where a number of the children will be disconnected from education for possibly an entire calendar year. So that achievement gap is going to expand tremendously. And so when things are back to normal, we need to not just do what we were doing before, we need to aggressively revamp education and pay attention to it, which is why I like when I hear president-elect call for building back better. Not just do what we did before, but look at how we might be able to do things better. And then of course, policing is high on my agenda and uh, the Affordable Care Act, I could go on and on. <laughs> well, I think you're, you're, you're so right to raise education because normally in national politics, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. You know, my, my students, college students at UC Berkeley and at your alma mater of USC, um, have struggled with exactly these challenges. I have some students who log on from their bedroom or their parents' study. Right. I have others you know, who drive and sit outside of Starbucks or McDonald's late at night to get a Wi-Fi signal. And of course, in K-12 education, the disparity is even greater. So you're exactly well, right to run. Uh, right, and just think about um, children in the primary grades, because there's this assumption that if you give a child or a young person the technology that it's in their DNA and they'll be able to figure it out. Well, that doesn't apply to a six-year-old. And what about a six-year-old whose parents are essential workers and they can't sit there in front of the computer that they might not know how to work? And so the digital divide, the uh, achievement gap, all of that stuff is magnified during this pandemic. And so we have to think about that when life is more uh, back to normal. Well, we could spend the next 45 minutes just on that issue, given its import. Right. But you also, you mentioned just in passing, and I want to come back to it. You remember the critical, you mentioned the critically important issue of criminal justice reform. And earlier mm -hmm. this year, we had Senator Tim Scott on this program. And we know wow. how hard you worked and the leadership you showed to work with him and others in Congress in both parties to fashion criminal justice reform legislation. Can you talk a little bit about what the prospects you are for you see for progress on that front going forward? Sure. Well, I will tell you that everything depends on January 5th, and January 5th is the runoff election in Georgia. If we win both of those seats, if both of those seats are Democratic seats, and then there is an even split in the Senate, and uh, Vice President Harris can break the tie, 
then I will say that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will pass. If we don't ca capture both of those seats, then I believe that we will do policing reform, but it will be much more uh, compromised. It will be much more uh, watered down. And I work with Senator Scott, and I know that he wants to get something done. So I'm convinced we will be able to get it done, but I want it to be transformative. I don't want it to just touch on the surface. Okay. So in addition to a myriad of public policy challenges, in just a few minutes, we'll go to questions from our audience that Lorna will help will will, will help shepherd for you. Um, sure. But before we do, I also um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the president elect. You've talked about some of his policy priorities, but there's also all sorts of talk in Washington and Los Angeles and everywhere in between about the administration that he's building. And while for the most part, he's received fairly, very favorable reviews on his early cabinet appointments, there's also been some concerns voiced some critical from critical constituencies in the Democratic Party um, about those appointments as well. I wonder if you'd be willing to give an assessment as to what you've seen so far from the president-elect's appointments, but what you hope to see and expect to see going forward. Well, what I hope to see and what I, what I expect to see is that the president-elect will keep his word. And that is that the cabinet, his cabinet will look like America. And I believe that he will hold to that. And I've been impressed by his appointments so far, the diversity. Now there's more appointments to go and there's more diversity that's needed. Uh, but I think that we should give the administration time but it is absolutely right for everybody to be active and to voice their concerns and to raise their questions because it does have an impact. But uh, I take him at his word and I think that he has delivered so far and will continue to deliver. Not, not to put you on the spot. Okay, maybe to put you on the spot a little <laughs> bit, but are there any of the cabinet, the, the unfilled cabinet seats on which you see a particular candidate who you would hope he would uh, who you would hope you select? Are there men or women um, under consideration who you think would be particularly wise choices on his part? Uh, sure, and let me just tell you a, a little more formally, you're not putting me on the spot because in my capacity as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, we are definitely putting forward names. Um, uh, for example, Patrick Gaspard for the uh, Secretary of Labor, uh, Phil Washington uh, for Secretary of Transportation, now, there are other names floating for that position as well, and including our mayor, but uh, speaking from the uh, Congressional Black Caucus that's focusing on African-American uh, appointments, and I'm sure that there are many others, and we want to make sure that the ones that have been proposed do get confirmed as well. Great. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to go back to Congress for a minute. You talked a minute ago about the critical import of the Georgia runoff elections on January 5th. Mm -hmm. But of course, the House of Representatives has an extremely narrow majority as right. well. Um, how will that change? How will that much smaller uh, margin in the House, should you still be there, of course, how will that affect uh, your ability to get work done with such a smaller margin for error? Well, I do think it's going to present some challenges, but I think most of the challenges will come from my Republican colleagues attempting to divide us with parliamentary maneuvers. I think when it comes to key pieces of legislation, key bills like the stimulus, et cetera, I think Democrats will stand united and it will be okay. And the, the, the speculation, um, uh, well, not just the speculation, but the reporting of some of the tensions that have emerged between more centrist and more progressive members of the caucus, you don't see that as being uh, a, diff uh, a particularly difficult challenge, even with a smaller majority. No, well, I will tell you that just the example over the last couple of years, um, you know, the Democratic Party, as is always said, we have a big tent. And so not only do we have gender and racial and ethnic diversity, but we have political diversity. That's one of the things that the diversity is one of the things that makes us very different than the Republican Party. And so within the Legislative Black Caucus, for example, we have very progressive members and we have members that consider themselves conservative. But when it comes to the major pieces of legislation, you would be hard pressed to find where there was some big split. 
Even our most progressive members that are referred to as the squad, if you looked at their legislative record, you know, with, with very few exceptions, they vote with the team. That doesn't mean that they don't have political positions that they express uh, apart from a particular piece of legislation. That tends to be what the news media picks up on. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day workings of the House, you don't find the splits and you don't find the um, differences in terms of it being hostile within the Democratic caucus. Okay. Well, I'm gonna ask you just one final question and then Lorna is going to come back happily and take over for me to make sure that you get to answer as many smart questions from our audience members as possible with the remaining time. Before we do, we've talked a lot about the future. Congresswoman, I'd like to talk for just a moment about your past mm -hmm. because a lot of our audience members, while they know about your work in the House and your work in the Assembly, they don't know about your work before that, particularly the, the, the remarkable work you did founding the organization Community Coalition. And I'll admit, um, I'm a big admirer of the group. One of my all-star former students is now the COO there, and I brag about oh, him pretty relentlessly. That's wonderful. Um, we always like to say, no offense to any elected officials of either party, that politics is too important to be left solely to the politicians. Exactly. And I'm wondering if before we go to the audience questions, if you could inform our audience a little bit about what motivated you to start Community Coalition and tell them a little bit about the work that the organization still does. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just tell you how much I agree with what you just said, uh, because I think that oftentimes in our American culture, we see politics completely connected to elections, and I don't. And so what happened is, is that in the 1980s, when the war on drugs was raging, when crack cocaine was a horrible health problem, and when gang violence was also a health problem in the community, what we did as a society is we criminalized and incarcerated health and economic issues. And so I was full-time on the faculty at USC Medical School and just became obsessed behind what was clear to me, policies that were gonna lead to mass incarceration. That wasn't even a term that we used during those days, but it was obvious when we saw the laws change. And so I left my teaching job and went to South Central and started Community Coalition with the goal in mind of trying to shift the agenda away. Now, if you think about it, we have another uh, health crisis of opioid addiction. Nobody is talking about criminalizing that. I think it's for a few reasons. One, the people who use opioids are different. Uh, they're predominantly white. But also, we understand much more about addiction today than we did 30 years ago. One of the other goals of the Community Coalition was to recruit, raise, and train the next generation of leaders. And so I was very happy to leave the organization 15 years ago to demonstrate that the person that started the organization doesn't have to and shouldn't remain forever, but should actually pass the baton and leave and move on. So they know they can call on me 24 seven, but I've never been on the board. And uh, um, I you know, have not been actively a part of the organization, but they address criminal justice reform, foster care, um, street violence. There's a lot of different issues that they address. But over the years, they've also developed the political sophistication to have precinct networks and uh, do voter education and mobilization. Well, phenomenal organization, still doing terrific work. And for those of our audience members today who haven't been aware of, uh, of them, uh, thank you very much for providing the additional information. I'm going to end my monopoly on this, Lorna, and let you take the wheel. And now we get to go to my favorite part of the program where our audience members get to ask much smarter questions than I did. So, Congresswoman, okay, thank you very much for listening to me. Now it's going to sure. get much more interesting. Okay. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. That was awesome. Good questions. You've asked a lot of the things that I had some questions myself. So thank you. And I'm sure the audience really appreciate that. So the first question from the audience is, do you think that the two parties will be able to work together with the new administration, President Biden and um, Vice President Harris, as well as the new members that are coming into Congress? And how will you facilitate um, a joy for effort specifically? Well, actually, I work uh, very well with my Republican colleagues. I, a couple of weeks ago, passed two pieces of legislation related to criminal justice reform with a complete bipartisan basis. So there is a lot of collaboration that goes on, but unfortunately, it is not covered in the media. 
So the public just thinks that we never get along, never work together on anything. Uh, but I, I think the real answer to that question lies with what is Trump going to do? I mean, I am hoping that come January 21st, when he flies away in that helicopter, he goes away. <laughs> he goes away and gives us a break. Because if he continues to have rallies and tweet and mobilize the 7 million people that vote, voted for him and continues to, be, to, to lead in a racist and antagonistic manner, then the Republicans who would like to get things accomplished here will continue to operate under the fear that leaves them paralyzed. And that's what we've seen over the last four years. They know, they know better. They know what's going on but they have felt under his thumb and under his fist, I should say. Amazing, amazing. Um, how should um, Biden deal with the those Republicans who continues um, to pursue that the election was stolen, the mantra that the, the election was stolen? I don't think he should deal with them at all. I think he should just <laughs> move forward, move forward and move forward without them because even the the Republican members of Congress that are saying that they know better. They are playing to Fox News. They are playing to their base, but they do know how the government functions. And they do know that the vote that happened yesterday ends the discussion. The Electoral College has voted. Even Mitch McConnell referred to, now it took him until today, a month and a week past the election, to actually utter the phrase president-elect. So I think that the senators will take his cue and deal with uh, Biden and Harris as though they are the president and vice president. Okay, the next question from the audience, even before Senator McConnell refused to meet or even grant a hearing for um, Garland, he held House, he held House passed legislation at his desk, just like he's doing now, not even sending to the committee or to review it. How do we overcome one man being able to block the urgency of business of our nation? Well, he needs to be fired. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We, we stop this by turning out to vote in Georgia and electing two Democrats. Then Mitch McConnell will not have that power. If the Republicans win those seats, then Mitch McConnell will continue doing exactly what we see him doing. Unfortunately, I happen to believe that until the Republican Party is stabilized and moves past Trump, they really shouldn't be in a position of power right now. Great. This question comes from Linnell Washington, who is the city planner in Los Angeles. Congresswoman. Can you reflect on what is happening in Ethiopia's Tigray state and what the United States is prepared to do in efforts to bring stability to the area? Yes, I think that it is a tragedy. It actually breaks my heart. I have been to Ethiopia many times and we know in Los Angeles, we have a very large and prosperous Ethiopian community. And when the prime minister uh, took office a couple of years ago, one of the things that he did was he tried to break with the old regime, which was controlled by the ethnic group that you just mentioned, the Tigres. They are a minority of Ethiopians, but they held power for several decades. And when the new prime minister came to town, he took their power away from them, and they essentially have been aggrieved ever since. And so one of the things that we did in this administration, or I should say the administration did, is cut off funding to Ethiopia. That's not what we should be doing right now. We should be assisting the Ethiopians. And frankly, that is one on a long list of things that need to happen when President Biden and Vice President Harris take over. We have to do a reset of our foreign policy. Remember, this administration started by referring to all 54 countries on the continent of Africa as S-hole countries. And so we have to do a complete reset because people around the world now look at us and say, we used to admire you guys, but <laughs> we don't know what you guys are doing over there now. And so we have to repair our image. And I am completely confident 
that President Biden, with his decades of experience in foreign policy, will be able to make that reset. Reset. Until then, I feel like we don't have much to stand on. Great, thank you. Uh, next question from the audience. Have you been advised about the Board of Education considering how to deal with the lost education during the pandemic? It is obvious the virtual education is not offering the same education as in-person and all or most kids, especially the LAUSD, will be behind. Where, where should they be going and how, how are we going to be dealing with this? Well, I haven't, the, the direct answer to the question is I have not been advised specifically, but uh, as a grandparent, <laughs> um, watching my grandsons um, try to manage online learning as a six and 11 year old, it is extremely challenging and I'm very worried at what they are losing. And so I think there needs to be a very aggressive plan at LAUSD for when we are back to normal, how are our kids going to catch up? Because you know very well in exclusive private schools, they have figured out a way to continue education. And uh, we have not. Um, I think that LA Unified has done the best they could, but we need to figure out what happens when the vaccine, when we've reached herd immunity and we're getting our lives back to normal. We can't just send those kids back in the classroom and act as though they didn't miss an entire year of school. I think we're going to need a very aggressive strategic plan. Definitely, definitely. Congresswoman Bass, what are some short-term realistic changes which can be made to the LA Police Department to shift certain responsibilities to professionals better equipped to deal with treatment of homelessness, mental illness, et cetera? Well, first of all, and, and Lorna, as a nurse, you certainly are aware of this. People often say that, um, what do you expect when a person with mental illness becomes violent? What do you, you expect to send in a social worker? No, of course not. But you and I know specifically that if you gave the proper health care to people with mental illness, they would not be in a violent crisis. So first of all, it should be prevented to begin with. What we have done as a society is that we have defunded health, social, and economic programs. And when things fall through the cracks, we leave it to the police to pick up the pieces, which is why we have a jail in downtown LA called Twin Towers, which is known as the nation's most expensive uh, mental health institution. It is a crime in our country that we have essentially resorted to incarcerating people with health problems, a mental illness. That has been our solution as a society. And I think that is one of the biggest issues that police departments have to deal with. But a lot of the problems that we have in our communities is because we have not chosen to prevent things that are very preventable. And then when something happens, we leave it to the police to clean up. Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, what will uh, success look like at the end of the first um, Biden administration in your view? A pandemic that has gone away. It, it will be a memory of what life used to be like when we had to wear masks, a prosperous economy, a nation that has a much higher awareness of in inequality, inequity, and racial, um, racial issues. Right and maybe even some solutions to some of the structural discrimination that takes place. So when President-elect calls for building America back better, we know that President Trump uh, selected secretaries for the agencies who were given a mission to go in and essentially destroy the agencies. So not only is President Biden going to have to rebuild the Department of Justice, the Department of Health, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Education, but it's an opportunity to examine those agencies for structural discrimination, structural inequality, repair that, and build the agencies back better. That's what I would like to see at the end of a first term. Okay, and the next question from an audience is, what is the next big step in the battle for social justice? 
I, I mean, you know, I, I am just so singularly focused on COVID. That is the next step in the battle for social justice. And that is that we have communities that are disproportionately impacted health-wise, economically, and socially. That has to be rectified. I see that as the fight that is right in front of us right now. And we have to address that. Then afterwards, we can address the underlying health, social, and economic issues that these communities suffer from. And that goes leads right into the next question. What should, be, what should we be doing to begin seriously addressing the racial wealth gap? Well, there's the racial wealth gap and then there's you know, structural racism. I, I really feel that in our country, we have never in 240 plus years been able to have a serious discussion about race. For the most part, you have half of the country that says there's no problem at all. You can't begin to address the problem that you do not admit exists. So a parallel to that are those people who say that COVID is a hoax, that there's no pandemic. So if you apply that kind of thinking to race, how can we ever deal with it if you can't say that there is a problem? The thing is, is that when we do talk about race, we only talk about it from the vantage point of individual behavior. And then everybody feels guilty and emotional and all of that. If we talked about it from a systemic perspective and say, and say, let's examine the education system. Where is there inequity? Where are there structural barriers? Let's examine the healthcare system. Let's examine the justice system. Let's examine housing. Let's examine jobs. In each of those categories, there are structural barriers that have historically left populations behind. That's nothing anyone should feel guilty about. Let's examine what those barriers are and remove them. All of us as a society benefits. So the issue of racial inequity is not a black issue or a brown issue. It is an issue of all of us. All of us would do better if we could address racism, if we could address poverty, that lifts up the entire nation. Awesome. Well, um, the audience seems to want to give a lending hand here, Congresswoman Bass. What action do you suggest that we in the audience take to help you pass relief before Congress recesses? What do I look for? How can they help you? How can the audience help you? What can we do as an audience to make sure you get this relief passed in Congress? It's Christmas time. I guess folks need needs help. And um, it seemed like it's been played around in Congress for a long time. What can the public do to press this and make sure they get some help by the, before Christmas? McConnell, 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 McConnell. <laughs> we will pass it out of the House. That is not the issue. The issue is whether or not the head of the Senate will allow it to come up. And so you can certainly call his office in DC. You can call his office in Kentucky but you need to express your absolute outrage at the fact that we have not acted. You know, in the House, we have acted more than once. The first bill that we passed was over six months ago, and it is still sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk. Then we passed another bill about three months ago. Both of those bills are sitting on his desk. Now there is a proposal for another bill. So I'm confident that the bills will pass the House where things stall is in the Senate. Right, yep, um, that is so true. You have been in support of Africa uh, under the Trump administration and as president, uh, presently the Congressional Black Caucus chair, what do you see is possible with the new administration? Well, Especially regarding the increase in trade with minorities and Africa um, African-American businesses in the U.S. and Africa? Well, well first and foremost, I want to say that uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris respect the continent of Africa. That's first and foremost. And so I know that they will remove some of the barriers that the Trump administration has put up. For example, the Muslim ban. He has blocked uh, visas from certain African countries. Lorna, I was in Sudan uh, at the end of last year, 
And I was there because they have a new government and they were really looking to reestablish and build their relationship with the United States. And I was over there in support of the Trump administration's policies at the time. But while I was there talking to government leaders, breaking news, President Trump now bans people from Sudan coming to the United States. So stabilizing policy in every category, whether you're talking about domestic or foreign policy, stabilizing it so that people around the world can trust us again. So you can imagine how ridiculous I looked sitting over there talking about US policy towards Sudan and US policy towards Sudan changed by tweet while I was sitting in a meeting. Yes. So okay. Biden has many decades of history of working around the world. He is respected and trusted by international leaders. And so I feel confident that we will be able to right this ship. I just wish it would be tomorrow. I guess many of us feel the same way. <laughs> Given the makeup of the Supreme Court and the likely Senate composition, what will be the changes, changes of passing an aggressive plan to reduce carbon emissions? Well, if, if the makeup of the Senate is majority Republican, there will not be um, good climate policy. Now, the Biden administration is gonna do everything they can by executive order, but they can't do everything by executive order. They need legislative authority. They need appropriations. And so that will be the limitation. And people will be very disappointed that we do not aggressively address uh, climate change. And so for all of those people that will be very disappointed that we're not able to do it, I hope you're phone banking into Georgia. And you can go to helpgeorgiawin.com. You can Google Stacey Abrams because she is leading the way. You can phone bank from anywhere in the country into Georgia. So if you're concerned about climate and Congress being able to get something done, you have a role to play. You can participate. Help us win those two seats. You know, okay. Uh, I know you've worked a lot with foster children. So this is a good question for you from the audience again. What is the most important reform needed to support California's foster, foster children? Well, you know, like everything else, COVID is impacting the child welfare community. And so we have a lot of children that are kind of stuck in limbo because social workers can't go and do some of the visits that they typically do to make sure that a home is okay. And so right now, what needs to happen is the extension of foster care services beyond the age of 18 so that young people are literally not put out in the street on their 18th birthday. So resources need to continue. That's what needs to happen immediately. Uh, and then there's a lot of other things once we're past the pandemic, but that's the immediate issue. Uh, what factors do you think are different now than they have been earlier in our history that will make it possible for us to accomplish the excellent changes you are talking about? Well, I mean, I think that, that because of what has happened over the last four years has been so extreme with the Trump administration, having an administration that is openly racist, that is openly hostile, um, I think that has created an, a, a sense of awareness in our country where we're able now to raise the question of race. I mean, after George Floyd was tortured and murdered over nine minutes and the whole world saw it, it was the first time that I recall that we saw a police murder where people connected it up to systemic racism. Prior to that, it was viewed as, well, that's just one bad police officer and maybe one bad individual. People understood it as a bigger question. People understand now immigration differently. People understand dreamers. People understand the environment because we have spent four years with a president who has assaulted us multiple times a day through tweets and through policy that actually hurts communities, that I think that has raised the level of awareness of people. And I think that provides a basis for us to solve some of these problems. Okay, next question is, 
Biden has been criticized for so many appointments of the old guard people. Don't it make sense though, to have the team who have an institutional memory it will take to repair the radical changes brought about by the current administration's erosion of career employees and radical changes in mission of so many agencies. I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm fearful for the cabinet secretaries because when they get the keys to their offices for, at these agencies, it's no telling what they're gonna find. I mean, one thing I know for a fact is that in many of the agencies, there's been a mass exodus of people. And so they're gonna have to go in and essentially rebuild these agencies. And so the idea that um, the president elect is relying on people with experience is a good thing. We need to have normalcy. We need to remember how a president is supposed to behave because we, I think, normalize the chaotic behavior that we have seen over the last four years. And I am so looking forward to a president that the world looks up to as opposed to makes fun of, um, that we go back to being the country that we were four years prior. Definitely. And I think we just need to have a little patient and, and see where things go. I think he's doing a great job with the appointment. So we just need to be patient, but at the same time, keep your feet to the pedal and let your representative know what you need. So keep your feet on the pedal. Uh, wow. Next question. Can you comment on how the Democrats will work with the more progressive members of Congress? For example, the squad. Mm -hmm. Are these um, policies, are there policies of theirs that you support and would like to see come before the House? Sure, uh, we agree on lots of different policies and have worked well together. Uh, there are some policies that they push that I feel are more aspirational. It's not that I would disagree with them. It's just that I don't know that they could take place tomorrow. But, um, you know, I think that you see a lot of the uh, press talking about the differences in the Democratic Party now, but I, I don't see it playing out to it being very divisive. Um, you see the, the four women that are referred to as the squad. If you review their voting records, you will see that 90% of the time, if not more, we're all voting together. Okay, next question. Um, there has been a focus on African-American representation in California leadership, but I'm concerned that the Latinx population is not represented either. Can you right. comment on how the balance representation in our state? Well, absolutely, and I would agree with that. We need to make sure that everyone is represented. And so, unfortunately, one of the flaws of our system is that a state with 40 million people only has two senators, and a state with 600,000 people has two senators. Because I absolutely agree that there needs to be representation in the Senate. Now, I think that you will see that there is strong representation from the Latinx community in the House of Representatives because the House on the Democratic side really reflects the U.S. population. That is not the case on the Republican side. Okay, next year, will Congress finally fix the Electoral College? No, <laughs> <laughs> we won't because to change the Electoral College requires a constitutional amendment. And as I just described, we have states that have populations under a million, and we have states like California with 40 million. Well, those states with smaller populations would feel that they would be disadvantaged if there was a change in the Electoral College. So given that for the last, let's see, 38, 39 years, we've not been able to pass a constitutional amendment for equal rights for women, I don't think we're getting ready to get rid of the Electoral College. Okay. How do you get voters out in 2022 without a Trump to vote against? Well, you know what? I think that that is work that all of us can participate in, and that is not work that should just be left to elected officials. All of us can be involved in that. I started a group called Sea Change, 
And uh, what Sea Change does is goes out now and does voter education in preparation of the election in 2022. We need to talk to voters and we need to engage them and stay connected to them so that they don't develop the behavior of just voting in presidential elections. One of the things that we suffer from in our society and our American culture is that we're very apolitical. We can tell you about the celebrities, about the athletic teams. We know all of that information, but we don't have any idea what a member of Congress is supposed to do. So in my district, now part of my district is very affluent, very well educated. Part of my district is the inner city. It doesn't matter what side of the district I'm on. If I have a town hall, I have to spend the first 20 minutes explaining that I am not in city council. Right, okay. Well, we're getting ready to wrap it up. I give it, have the last question here for you. Um, let's see. Do you think there is any chance that Congress will be able to enact comprehensive immigration reform? What do you think should be major, the major element of such legislation? Well, let me just say, once again, everything rests on January 5th. If we do not take those Senate seats, there is not a chance, I don't believe, that we would pass comprehensive immigration reform. But having said that, I must tell you that I have just been obsessed behind the kidnapping and abuse of these children. I, I mean, I think it's one of the most egregious things that happened in this administration. And one of the things that I want to see happen, I'm working on legislation that requires the federal government to reunite these children, because right now the federal government is not responsible to do that. I think we need to reunite these children. I think the families need to be granted asylum. I think that the families need to be paid punitive damages because the damages that were done to these children can be lifelong. And, and so there's many different aspects to comprehensive immigration reform. But I did have to tell you about the piece that I'm obsessed about and we'll focus on. Well, thank you again, Congresswoman Bass. You have been amazing. I'm sure the audience really enjoyed your answering uh, your, you answering those questions today. And um, I, to the audience, I wanna thank you for tuning in and, um, and for those amazing questions. And I wanna wish to all of you a happy holiday. And I will now turn it back over to my colleague and board member, Dan Schoen. <laughs> Well, thank you, Lorna. Thank you for not just for your leader, not just for steering us through a fascinating conversation with the Congresswoman, but for your leadership on our board and in our community. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Congresswoman Bass, because we have a couple minutes left, there's one other question that came to mind, and I hope you'll indulge me before we uh, let you get away. Um, we were talking extensively earlier, appropriately, um, about the challenge of COVID-19. And of mm -hmm. course, as all of our audience knows, and uh, just yesterday, we began to see the first exciting, inspirational, heartwarming sights mm -hmm. of some of our frontline healthcare workers being vaccinated. Now, obviously, there's a lot of months ahead before we all have that uh, uh, have that uh, opportunity, but we're seeing public opinion polling showing very large numbers of our fellow Americans who don't trust the vaccine. Right. Some of them are conservative voters who've you know, you know, heard from those who share their ideological convictions. But we also see uh, a very large number of uh, Americans in communities of color who are understandably suspicious of the vaccine. I'm wondering if what you, what you can tell us about what Congress can do and will do to make sure that those communities understand the importance of, uh, of using the vaccine. Well, first of all, I think this is a problem that can absolutely positively be addressed. It is most important that the vaccine be separated from this administration. How on earth could the African-American and Latino community accept anything that is viewed as coming out of the Trump administration? And so I am was very, because frankly, I felt the same way when I saw that the vaccine was being rushed, when I saw that he wanted to have it done before the election, then that certainly raised my suspicions as well. But one of the things that has been very clear over the last month 
is that the scientists have separated themselves from the administration. So this vaccine is not political. It will be safe. By the time it is ready for the general public, millions of people will have had this vaccine. But here is the way we solve that problem. Congress, state governments, county governments need to give money to community-based organizations who are trusted messengers. Community Coalition has been on the ground for 30 years. So if people hear a message from Community Coalition, they know because they have a history with that organization. And there are organizations like Community Coalition throughout the Los Angeles area and throughout our country. So there have to be trusted messengers. The other thing specifically in regard to the African-American community is people in the community need to understand that one of the scientists that created the vaccine is an African-American woman. When people find things out like that, they will say, this is a vaccine like the measles. This is not a vaccine that has anything to do with Trump. That is going to be our challenge. Now, there's, there is suspicion in general in the African-American community, and it's not all about Tuskegee. People keep quoting Tuskegee. It's about the fact that in 2020, black women die in childbirth, childbirth like this is a developing country. So the health disparities that exist today, part of the reason for those health disparities is because black people do not receive the same quality of care from the medical community. And by the way, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic status. So even if you look at affluent black people and compare their health status to white folks, it is still a disparity that is there. So I think that, that the black community will eventually accept the vaccine when trusted messengers communicate and when it is disassociated with the Trump administration. Okay, and so lastly, finally, um, would you be willing to share with us either a prediction for 2021 or a resolution that you've made for the new year? Oh, <laughs> you know, a, a, uh, a resolution I've made is really just to be healthy and to make sure that my family and friends are healthy, but I want to serve as one of those trusted messengers. When the vaccine comes around, I wanna take it publicly. I wanna make sure that I go out in the community and encourage people to do so. So that's a responsibility that I feel I should absolutely take on. Well, over the over the course of the year, or at least the several months since the pandemic shut down the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall's in-person meetings and has found and has you know, led to our online conversations instead. We've had the good fortune of having any number of respected leaders from across the political spectrum. Adam Schiff has joined us. Kevin McCarthy has been with us. Alex Padilla has been with us, as I mentioned earlier. Senator Tim Scott, your partner on criminal justice reform. But mm -hmm. if I can speak for our members in our audience, I can't think of a better way to end a very challenging year than to be have a, a conversation like this one, so illuminating and so inspiring, with Congresswoman Karen Bass. Kim, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn the floor back to you for, for the close. But Congresswoman, thank you so much for being with us. I can't think of a better way to close the year. Absolutely. Dan, thank you for Dan, having me. Dan, what perfect words. Dan, what perfect words. Congresswoman, we are just so thrilled to have had you today. What an important conversation. Dan, thank you as always for helping us participate and, and bring the program to light. And Lorna, thank you so much for your uh, participation as well. It was great having one of both board members. Dan is a board member as well as part of our program. So thank you all very, very much. As I mentioned, we're in the middle of our annual fundraising campaign through the end of December. And this campaign is so important as it helps us raise the money that we need to cover all of our operating expenses to keep all of these wonderful programs going. So please text the word give to the number on the screen and please do what you can. We can't do this without you. Now we do have Thursday, Dan's back with politics in the time of coronavirus to take us out for the year. And afterwards, we have a uh, great discussion with him privately with our members who can, can ask uh, questions directly of Dan, uh, of him. And this is a great uh, benefit for our members. So maybe become, become uh, consider becoming a member. So just go to our website at lawacth.org 
become a member, make a donation, register for programs. We, everybody, please stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you Thursday. Congresswoman, thank you again so very much. Mm -hmm.